Are you ready for the word? Sure. Good deal. We'll be in Matthew 7, but also, if you have an Apocrypha with you, uh, 2 Maccabees chapter 6 and chapter 7. There are two statements I want to give you this morning. I want you to tell me which one of those is true. You didn't know there's going to be a quiz. Without Yeshua, we perish. There is no salvation. Statement number two. Without Torah, we perish. There is no salvation. We're going to let those uh, simmer for a little while. And then we're going to read. I'm going to read to you. I'm going to do actually a lot of reading this morning. It's going to require you to be very disciplined uh, in hearing. So I'm going to re begin reading out of Second Maccabees chapter 6, verse 1. Not long after this, the king, who is the king in the story of the Maccabees? Antiochus. Not long after this, Antiochus sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers and not to live after the laws of Yahweh and to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter Olympias and that in Gerizim call it Jupiter the defender of strangers, as they did desire that dwelt in that place. So Jupiter, in case you didn't know, that's the same as Zeus. Zeus, Jupiter, referring to the same God, just referring to him by different cultures, uh, assigning him different names. I'm going to now skip up down to verse 10 in that same chapter. For there were two women brought who had circumcised their children, whom when they had openly led round about the city, the babes hanging at their breast, they cast them down headlong from the wall. So these two women are killed for circumcising their infants. Since there was a law that prohibited that, were the women wrong to have circumcised their children? Would Yahweh have understood their situation and been okay with them putting off that commandment for a while? Do you think they would have been better off neglecting to do it on the eighth day as commanded and waiting, waiting until time changed, even if that was five years, ten years, twenty years? Would it have been better served if they'd have just waited and said, Yahweh, we're not disobeying you. We're just going to wait. Let me begin reading in verse 18. Eleazar, one of the principal scribes, an aged man and of well-favored countenance, was constrained to open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh. But he, choosing rather to die gloriously than to live stained with such an abomination, spit it forth or spit it out, and came of his own accord to the torment. Again, I'll ask you, was Eleazar correct? Is eating pork an, ab an abomination that stains us? Because that's what he said. He said he had rather die gloriously than be stained with that abomination of eating pork. As it behooved them to come, they are resolute to stand out. Let me read that again. As it behooved them to come, that are resolute to stand out against such things as are not lawful for love of life to be tasted. So let me put verse 19 and 20 together. Verse 19 tells us what he did. Verse 20 says that it behooved Eleazar and others like him to do what he did. Now, behooved means he saw it as his duty, his responsibility. He saw himself being obligated to do what he did. Verse 20 says that it's not lawful to love life so much that you would eat pork. It's not lawful to say, okay, here's the command, don't eat swine's flesh, but here's somebody telling me that if I don't, I'm going to die. Verse 20 says, it's not lawful to love your life so much that you would break the commandment 
and eat the pork. Can that be true? Is it our obligation to keep the smallest command of Torah if threatened by death? Yeah. Would you consider the dietary laws of Leviticus 11 to be minor? Most do. <clears throat> and yet, we find that Yahweh spent an entire chapter talking about the subject. Leviticus chapter 11. Why did Eleazar and Mattathias deem it better to die or to go to war than to eat swine's flesh? Verse 21. But they that had the charge of that wicked feast, for the old acquaintance they had with Eleazar, taking him aside, besought him to bring flesh of his own provision, such as was lawful for him to use. In other words, go get a piece of lamb and bring it with you. And make as if he did eat of the flesh taken from the sacrifice commanded by the king. We're going to stand you up here. We're going to take a piece of that swine's flesh and we're going to give it to you. You drop it, pull your lamb out, and you eat it in front of everybody. That in so doing, he might be delivered from death. They're trying to save his life. And for the old friendship with them, find favor. We, they've known him a long time. They like him, like him. They don't want him to die. They said, you're a friend. We're going to do you a favor. Eat lamb, stew of pork. You don't have to eat the pork in order to live. In order to save his life, would that have been okay? Verse 23, he began to consider discreetly and as became his age and the excellency of his ancient years and the honor of his gray head whereupon was come and his most honest education from a child or rather the holy law made and given by Yahweh. Therefore he answered accordingly and willed them straight ways to send him to the grave. Verse 23 says he thought about it momentarily. Who wouldn't? And then he gave his answer. Send me to the grave. For it becomes not our age, he said, in any wise to dissemble. Whereby many young persons might think that Eleazar, being fourscore years old and ten, were now gone to a strange religion. The word dissemble means to give a false or misleading appearance, to hide the truth. It means to be untrue in your words or untrue in your deeds. It is, in a word, dissemble means to be deceitful. And he said, it's not becoming of our age to be deceitful in this way. Eleazar said, I will not deceive our young people by my actions, causing them to think that I am saying it's okay to compromise. I'm not saying it's okay to adopt the practices of other religions. I will not send that message. And so they through my hypocrisy and my desire to live a little time and a moment longer should be deceived by me and I get a stain to my old age and make it abominable. Hypocrisy he used here. In the other verse it was dissemble. Hypocrisy and dissemble are synonymous. He said, I don't want the young people to think that a desire to live a moment longer is more important than keeping Torah. My life's almost over anyway, but theirs is just a vapor. It'd be foolish to have a desire to live a little bit longer and to forsake Torah. Verse 26. For though for the present time I should be delivered from the punishment of men, yet should I not escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. Do you think he's being perhaps a little bit too zealous? Do you think it really mattered to Yahweh whether this 90-year-old man ate a piece of pork or not? He seems to think it matters. Wherefore now, manfully changing this life, I will show myself such as one as mine age requires. 
and leave a notable example to such as be young to die willingly and courageously for the honorable and holy laws. And when he had said these words, immediately he went to the torment. So how strong should one's dedication to Torah be? Should we die willingly and courageously for the holy laws? Do the dietary laws really matter that much? Let me ask it the way it's declared from pulpits in, in 2023. Doesn't Acts chapter 15 loose us from having to be as Eleazar was? Doesn't Acts 15 say that, that we can now eat pork? Didn't the vision in Acts 10 say that we can now do it? We don't have to live with the same zeal and dedication as Eleazar did. Verse 29. They that led him changing the goodwill, they bear him a little before into hatred. Their goodwill they had before is now changed into hatred because the foresaid speeches proceeded as they sought from a desperate mind. This man's crazy is what they begin to think. But when he was ready to die with stripes, he groaned and said, It is manifest unto Yahweh that has the holy knowledge that whereas I might have been delivered from death, I now endure sore pains in body by being beaten. But in soul, I am content to suffer these things because I fear Yahweh. Amen. And thus this man died, leaving his death for an example of a noble courage and a memorial of virtue, not only unto young men, but unto all of his nation. So he died simply because he refused to eat pork. Was it necessary that he actually died? 2 Maccabees chapter 7. This is the harder story to read, but we're going to take the time to read it. <clears throat> Came to pass also that seven brethren with their mother were taken, compelled by the king against Torah to taste swine's flesh, and were tormented with scourges and whips. It's against Torah to eat swine's flesh. We need to make sure we show that to our children in Torah. Not just tell them, but we take them to Leviticus 11 and show them. We need to read it to them. We need to help them read it for themselves. We need to explain it to them. We need to explain to them that it was written in Leviticus 11, but it existed before Leviticus 11. How do we know it existed before Leviticus 11? Give me proof that it was always in effect. Noah. Thank you. Knew the difference in clean and unclean. When Noah was putting the animals on the ark, Yahweh told him, one pair of the unclean, seven pair of the, un, uh, of the uh, clean. Okay. Well, how do you know which ones were clean and unclean? Right. All right. Well, we all know this, Leviticus 11, and we know that Noah separated the clean from the unclean. But isn't that just for the Jews? Isn't it part of what is the so-called Old Covenant? Didn't Yeshua die so that you and I could eat a pork chop? <laughs> Seven sons. One of them spake first and said this, What would you ask or learn of us? We're ready to die rather than to transgress the laws of our fathers. Now get the picture. Uh, verse 1 told us they've been told to eat pork. They refuse. The mother and the seven sons all refuse, so they're being scourged. Scourging is done with a whip, leather strips in which are embedded steel balls, steel spikes, and bones. It's meant to rip the flesh apart. They're all being scourged because they said no. While they're being scourged, one of them speaks up 
and, and, and says, why do you continue to beat us? Like you think we're going to change our mind or there's some, some answer you're trying to beat out of us other than the one we've already given you and that is we're not going to eat. Are they being too zealous? Does Yahweh really expect them to be this committed to instructions in Leviticus 11? Then Antiochus, being in a rage, commanded pans and cauldrons to be made hot, which forthwith being heated, he commanded to cut out the tongue of him that spoke first, cut off the utmost parts of his body, the rest of his brethren and his mother looking on. Now when he had thus maimed in all his members, he commanded him being yet alive to be brought to the fire and to be fried in the pan. And, and as the vapor of the pan was for a good space dispersed, they exhorted one another, the mother, with the mother, to die manfully, saying thus, Yahweh our Elohim looks upon us and in truth has comforted, comfort in us as Moses in his song, which witnessed to their faces declaring, saying, and he shall be comforted in his servants. So while the first son is dying, being fried alive, the other brothers are exhorting one another, stay true to Yahweh. They're even recalling scripture. They're thinking about a song that Moses wrote. And the mother's exhorting them, saying, yeah, stay true, y'all. Stay true. So when the first was dead after this number, they brought the second to make him a mocking stock. And when they had pulled off the skin of his head with the hair, they asked him, will you eat before you be punished throughout every member of your body? But he answered in his own language and said, no. Wherefore, he also received the next torment in order as the former did. And when he was at the last gasp, he said, you like a fury take us out of this present life but the king of the world shall raise us up who have died for his laws unto everlasting life I know they did it but did Yahweh really expect them to die for dietary laws after him was the third made a mocking stock and when he was required he put out his tongue and that right soon holding forth his hands manfully he stuck his tongue out quick, stuck out his hands, and said, have at it. And said courageously, these have I from heaven, and for his laws I despise them. And from him I hope to receive them again. I love Torah so much, any regard that I have for any part of my body in comparison seems like contempt for my body. That's how much I love Torah. Insomuch that the king and that they that were with him marveled at the young man's courage for that he nothing regarded the pains. Now when this man was dead also they tormented and mangled the fourth in like manner. So when he was ready to die he said this. It is good being put to death by men to look for hope from Yahweh to be raised up again by him. As for you, you shall have no resurrection to life. He'll be resurrected, all right, but not to life. Afterward, they brought the filth also and mangled him. Then looked he unto the king and said, You have power over men. You are corruptible. You do what you will. Yet think not that our nation is forsaken of Yahweh. But abide a while and behold his great power. You just hang around, king. Stick around. You're going to see his great power. How he will torment you and your seed. After him also they brought the sixth, who being ready to die said, Be not deceived without cause, for we suffer these things for ourselves, having sinned against our Elohim. Therefore marvelous things are done unto us. But you should not think that takest in hand to strive against Yahweh, that you will escape unpunished. But the mother, oh, she was marvelous above all and worthy of honorable memory. For when she saw her seven sons slain within the space of one day, she bore it with good courage because of the hope she had in Yahweh. Yea, she exhorted every one of them in her own language, filled with courageous spirits, stirring up her womanish thoughts with a manly stomach, 
She said unto them, I cannot tell you how you came into my womb, for I neither gave you breath nor life. Neither was it I that formed the members of every one of you. But doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generations of men and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again as you now regard not your own selves for his law's sake. Now the only law in question that day, all of them were in question, but the only law in question on this day was the one that told them that they couldn't eat pork. Is that a law worthy of taking a stand against so fervently that you lose seven sons in one day? Now Antiochus, thinking himself despised and suspecting it to be a reproachful speech while the youngest was yet alive, did not only exhort him by words but also assured him with oaths that he would make him both a rich and happy man if he would turn from the laws of his father and that also he would take him for his friend and trust him with affairs. He didn't just say that. He took an oath. I'll make you rich. I'll make you my friend. But when the young man would in no case hearken unto Antiochus, the king called his mother and exhorted her that she would counsel the young man to save his life. And when he had exhorted her with many words, it took a lot of talking. When he exhorted her with many words, she promised Antiochus, I'll counsel my son. Oh, does she counsel him? She bowing herself toward him, laughing the cruel tyrant to scorn, spake in her country language on this manner. Oh, my son, have pity on me that bear you nine months in my womb and gave you uh, such three years and nourished you and brought you up into this age and endured the troubles of education. She knew what it was to homeschool. She knew what it was to endure the troubles of education. She said to her son, I beseech you, my son, look upon the heaven and the earth. How about that? Look upon the things you can see. So she didn't think of heaven as an outer space. She thought of heaven as is defined in Genesis 1 as a firmament. Look at the firmament. Speaking of the Greeks, I got to thinking about that this week. I'm going to take just a little side note here. Side step. I got to thinking about that this week. The concept of a fixed earth on firm foundations with a firmament over it, a solid dome over it. Ultimately comes from Yahweh, but let's say it this way. is a Hebrew concept. It comes from the Hebrews who were taught by Yahweh, right? Everybody agrees with that. They call it the Hebraic concept or cosmology. You know where the globe concept comes from? From the Greeks. The Greeks who hate Yahweh, hate Torah. The Greeks who tried to stamp out any worship of Yahweh and tried to destroy every copy of Torah, they're the ones who came up with a concept of an earth that's spinning and a sun that's central. Yeah, let's think like the Greeks. <laughs> Not. Anyway, back to the mom. I beseech you, my son, look into the heaven and the earth. And all that is therein. You can see what is in the firmament. And you can see what is in the earth. Consider those. All of it was made, she said, by things that were not. And so was mankind made likewise. Fear not this tormentor. But being worthy of your brethren, take your death that I may receive you again in mercy with your brethren. Well, I ask again, was it necessary for him to die also as his brothers had? 
Was it necessary that he die in order to see his brethren in the resurrection? Was that really necessary? His mother is saying that he's required to be obedient unto death if he wants to see his brethren. Is she right? While she was yet speaking these words, the young man said, Whom do you wait for? I will not obey the king's commandment, but I will obey the commandment of the law that was given unto our fathers by Moses. And you, that have been the author of all mischief against the Hebrews, shall not escape the hands of Yahweh. For we suffer because of our sins, and though the living Elohim be angry with us for a little while for our chastening and our correction, yet shall he be at one again with his servants. But you, O godless man, and all other most wicked, and of all other the most wicked, be not lifted up without a cause, nor puffed up with uncertain hopes, lifting up your hand against the servants of Yahweh. You're making a mistake, sir. Stephanie and Glenn uh, both sent me a video yesterday of a Turkish lawmaker who declared that Israel cannot escape the wrath of God in, in uh, some yeah. Turkish law thing. <laughs> Say again. A parliament, yeah. Mm -hmm. Israel shall not escape the wrath of God. Turned to walk away from the podium, took about two steps and fell over with a heart attack. What this man's doing here in 2 Maccabees 7 is dangerous. And that's what this young man's telling him. You're lifting up your hand against the servants of Yahweh. For you have not yet escaped the judgment of Yahweh Adonai who sees all things. You think that you're, you've escaped. You haven't. You will face the wrath of Yahweh. Verse 36. <clears throat> For our brethren who now have suffered a short pain are dead under Yahweh's covenant of everlasting life. There's no such thing as a covenant that only binds one party. Now you understand why they were willing to die. They understood they were in covenant. And if they expected Yahweh to keep his end of the covenant, they had to keep their end of the covenant. But you, they said to Antiochus, through the judgment of Yahweh shall receive just punishment for your pride. But I, as my brethren, offer up my body and life for the laws of our fathers, beseeching Yahweh that he would speedily be merciful unto our nation and that you by torments and plagues may confess that he alone is Elohim. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, and that includes you, Antiochus. And that in me and my brethren, the wrath of the Almighty, which is justly brought upon our nation, may cease. Then the king, being in a rage, handled him worse than all the rest, and took it grievously that he was mocked. So this man died undefiled and put his whole trust in Yahweh. So again, we have to stop and ask. We're reading it, so we have to ask. Would he really have defiled himself by just tasting the pork? He seems to think he would have. Last of all, after the sons, the mother died. Verse 42 says, Let this be enough now to have spoken concerning the idolatrous feast and the extreme tortures. Well, having considered these stories, let me ask you again, to listen to those two statements and tell me which one is true. Without Yeshua, we perish. There is no salvation. And without Torah, we perish. There is no salvation. How do you think the two women who circumcised their sons and died for it would answer? Do you think they would answer that without Torah, we perish? There is no salvation. What about Eleazar? Would he have thought that? Without Torah, I perish. There is no salvation for me. Do you think this mother and her seven sons 
would agree that without Torah they perish and there is no salvation. Well, what about today? <clears throat> what about today? Would it still be true for us or has it changed? Certainly we say without Yeshua we perish. There is no salvation. We understand that. But would we dare to say the other with the same confidence? Or would we fear being told that we have fallen from grace if we believe that? Would we dare say without Torah we perish? There is no salvation. Matthew 7. Let's read it like, we've, like we're reading it for the first time. Matthew 7. Not everyone that says unto me, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, we got a problem right there beginning in verse 21. When you consider what's being said there and what's being taught Massively in our day and time. <clears throat> Yeshua said it's not by calling him Lord that we enter into the kingdom of heaven. But that is what's taught today. Just ask him into your heart. Make him Lord. Call him Lord. People are told Sunday after Sunday by pastors they trust. If you'll just ask him into your heart and say Jesus you're my Lord. You'll go to heaven. But Yeshua said that the ones who do that, let me, let me back up and say it this way. Yeshua said that the ones who enter the kingdom of heaven don't simply call him master. He said the ones that enter the kingdom of heaven not only call him master, but they do something. What do they do? What do they do? What do he say? Do what now? Does his will. Does the will of, of the Father. Huh. Well, how in the world would we ever figure out what Yahweh's will is for us? Towards instructions. Huh. Could it possibly be that simple? Is it possible that Yeshua is saying... That you can call him master all you want. But if you're not doing Torah, you're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, master, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils. And in your name done many wonderful works. So, we've got to stop and consider, what if, what if there are people who call Yeshua Master and they're also involved in a word of faith ministry where they prophesy? What if they call Yeshua Master and are heavily involved in a deliverance ministry and routinely cast out demons? What if they call Him Master and in, they're involved in a healing ministry where they do mighty works, that's what it means there. The, the word mighty works there, wonderful works, comes from the Greek word dunamis. Dunamis refers to mirac miraculous works of power. So they said we, we were involved in miraculous works. What I want you to do is contrast verse 21 with verse 22. I want you to notice what the people did. They came up with a substitute. They decided, ah, that keeping Torah, that's old stuff. So rather than just trying to live by all of those outdated laws, we'll, we'll do something else. We'll prophesy, cast out devils, and pray for miracles. 
see healings. That, that, that is showing we're serving him. Prophecies, casting out demons, and healing people. That's our work. Surely, it's more important to do these things than it is to just refrain from eating pork. Surely, it's more important that I prophesy and cast out demons than I, that, than, that I just rest on the Sabbath. Where's the benefit in that? But if I'm prophesying and casting out demons, that's really doing something. Well, let's see what Yeshua said. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. They will be professing to me, we did this. I will be professing to them, I never knew you. Then what did Yeshua say in the last part of verse 23? from me, you work in, uh, workers of iniquity. Literally, the Greek words there are, go away. Sounds a little nicer when we say, depart from me. <laughs> They're saying, we prophesied, we cast out demons, we healed the sick. And he looks at them and says, go away. Why? <clears throat> Because he said they work iniquity. They said we work miracles. We prophesied. We cast out demons. He said no you work iniquity. The word, the word work there. Um, is the word from which we get our word energy. The Greek word we get our word energy from. It means to be engaged in or engaged with. You're engaged with iniquity. The word iniquity, you know that word, it's anomia. Nomos means law. The negative particle A is used as a prefix. Thus, the word translated iniquity there literally is lawless or Torahless. Go away, you who are engaged in being Torahless. Lawless, go away. The modern day church teaches that those who follow Messiah need to strip themselves of Torah. They teach that those who follow Messiah should not engage in trying to do the law. No man can do it. So if you try to do it, you're falling from grace and you're sinning. That's what they teach. And right here, it is written for everybody to read. Yeshua said, I don't care if you call me master. I don't care if you prophesy. I don't care how many demons you cast out. I don't care how many miracles you claim to have performed. If you are engaged in being Torah-less... If you are not seeking to learn, keep, and do Torah, go away. <clears throat> Today with Hanukkah just behind us and with the stories of Hanukkah fresh in our mind, I want to ask you, don't you think that that is the only just thing that he can do. They're saying, we did all of this in your name. And he's saying, you're Torahless, so you got to go. Don't you think that that's the only just thing he can do? Could it be possible... To get to judgment and have those two mothers come before him who had circumcised their infants 
And because they had done so, they were humiliated in public had their infants killed before their very eyes, hung from their breasts, and they were cast off of a wall so that they fell and died, could he possibly tell them, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and then have him stand and watch as he said to so-called New Testament believers, aren't y'all glad y'all didn't have to keep the law? That's good. Could he stand there, or could these women stand there and watch while he let people into the kingdom who never kept any of his law? Yes. Could they stand there and watch while he said to another group, man, aren't you glad all you had to do is say a prayer when you was 12 years old and you got in? Could he bring before him the mother and her seven sons and have them stand there and watch people enter into the kingdom of heaven who celebrated the resurrection by eating ham on Sunday? No. Here, mom, seven sons, stand here. I want to show y'all something. These people are coming in because they said a prayer when they were a kid. And they celebrate my resurrection by eating ham on Sunday. How many commandments are they breaking? At least two. At least two. At least three. Not supposed to adopt pagan practices. Not supposed to eat ham. And not supposed to forsake the Sabbath. Or serving other gods. Serving other gods. Okay. So... Oh, I know y'all went through a lot of torment. But I'm going to let them in because they call me Lord. <laughs> I, I know when I ask these questions, I know that it pierces your heart and, and you have the same response as I, but I know what mainstream denominational members who watch this video are going to say. They'll regurgitate what they've been brainwashed into believing. They'll declare in their insolence against the Almighty that Yeshua will let those people into the kingdom of heaven because they have a different covenant and they're not required to keep the law. They enter in by the blood and by grace. Only the Jews had to keep the law is what they will say. They will say these things in spite of the fact that I'm telling them beforehand, I know they're going to say them. They will say these things being willfully blind to what is plainly written in Matthew chapter 7. Yeshua himself, this is not taking a writing of Peter or Paul or anybody else. Yeshua himself plainly saying, many are going to come before me on the day of judgment. And they're going to call me master, but they're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. They're going to say, master, we have done all these wonderful things in your name. And I'm going to tell them, go away. And people will be willfully blind to that and ignore it. Yeshua said, those who call him master, but don't do the will of, the, of Yahweh will not enter. And he makes it plain that the will of Yahweh that he is speaking of has nothing to do. Listen to this now. Yeshua makes it plain that doing the will of Yahweh, it has absolutely nothing to do with prophesying, casting out demons, or healing the sick. Yes. Yeah. It has to do with keeping Torah. Yeah. He makes it plain. And he will tell those who have not kept Torah to go away. This past week in my observance of Hanukkah, as I read these stories again, I became painfully aware that Yeshua has to tell the lawless to go away. Or else he's not being just to those who have gone on before us. Amen. I've used this illustration before, but it's worth repeating. 
if I were to go out <coughs> and adopt some children and bring them into my home and then allow them to live in my home by a different standard, by different requirements, by different rules than my own children live by, that would be wicked. Yes, sir. Would it be okay for me to allow them to disregard every instruction, every command, and every requirement that I placed on my birth children? Would it be okay for me to allow them to disregard it? These children have to live by these rules. You don't. Would that be just? Absolutely not. If I did let them live by a different set of rules, how do you think it would affect the children that were there before them. Well, how foolish it is for us to believe that we've been grafted into Israel, but Yahweh's going to let us live by a different set of rules. Now, understand this. <clears throat> I would not expect the adopted children who were not raised in my home to immediately know all the rules of the house. I would give them some grace and some mercy. Patience. I might lay down a few rules immediately. If you're going to live in my house, these rules you have to know immediately. The rest of them we'll learn as we go. Right? Once they learn them, I fully expect them to keep them because it is my house and my rules. Is that not what Acts 15 is really about instead of this twisted, perverted thing that's taught by mainstream denominations? Go read it. The first part of Acts 15 is Peter telling the Pharisees, go away. Yeshua has already made it plain, made it clear that we're not putting anybody under the burden that you try to place on them. In Acts 15, the first part, he's telling the Pharisees to go away. And the last part of Acts 15, it's telling the converts... We want to bring you into the assembly, but if you're coming into the assembly, there are four things that are required of you immediately, and all four of these come straight out of Torah. And then James declares, the rest of it they'll learn Sabbath by Sabbath as they go into the synagogue. Moses is read there every Sabbath. Let's give them room to grow. So hear these two statements again and tell me which one is true. Without Yeshua, we perish. There is no salvation. Without Torah, we perish. There is no salvation. Is the second one still as true today as it was in Eleazar's day? Matthew 7 says it is. We, we're declaring, man, without Yeshua, we're going to perish. We better learn to declare without Torah, we'd also perish. Because he said in Matthew 7, if we don't keep Torah, he's going to tell us, go away. If, if they both are true, well, let me say it this way. If, 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 if they both are not true, that makes Matthew 7, 22, 23 false. Because Matthew, in Matthew 7, Yeshua makes it clear those who think they, that having faith in Him and doing things in His name is enough are seriously mistaken. He makes it clear that without Torah we perish, there is no salvation. Now, now that's going to make so many people angry. But their anger can't destroy the truth. I'm going to be called a heretic for saying it, but I, all I'm doing is reading what Yeshua said. Those without Torah perish. They have no salvation. Even though they call him master. Even though they prophesy. Even though they cast out demons. Even though they heal the sick. <clears throat> because they didn't keep Torah they're told to go away yeah. Hanukkah always jerks the slack out of my chain 
Yep. And I'm thankful for it. We do not need, we cannot allow a lachidaical attitude toward the commandments. That's what we're being taught. That's what's, not we, but that's what's being taught. That's what's being preached. That's what everybody else is saying. We cannot allow that to penetrate our hearts and our minds. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.